The following interview was conducted with Jeffrey Spinner, Dean of the College of Science for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, July the 29th, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Great. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Sure. Thank you, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm born and raised in New Orleans, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a real true southerner from the deep south, although most people don't really realize that because a New Orleans accent is really uh, best described as a soft Brooklyn accent. It's very different from if you go 60 miles away in, in any direction uh, in Louisiana, then you get more of a southern accent. Uh, so I, I, uh, I'm very much I pride myself as a southerner, it's part of my identity. My family actually has been in New Orleans for many, many generations. They came in the mid-1800s and, and genealogy is one of my uh, passions, so I've, I've been very interested in that. Uh, my dad um, and my mom are, are both recently passed away. Uh, my dad was for a long time chief engineer at Chevron Oil, so he brought in the, uh, really the scientific and technical appreciation to me and my mom uh, was really probably the the guiding force in my life. She was just a, a great role model, just extremely compassionate and dedicated person and she she uh, she did quite a lot for me. Uh, but my family is still centered in New Orleans. All my brothers live there and uh, a lot of a lot of cousins and um, that's really all across. So, sure. so what about high, tell us a little bit about high school, where you went to high school and what activities and things? Uh, I, uh, New Orleans is a very Catholic city, so I went through uh, parochial school and then Christian Brothers in grade school and De La Salle High School, uh, which is also run by the Christian Brothers. So uh, great schools, they really, uh, they gave me a lot of good foundation and I think that's a lot of what I based my, uh, my studies in college on, just getting that uh, initial kind of excitement and grounding in science and math, which really propelled me further. Further. Was there any particular activities? That, what about athletics too in high school? And how large a school was it? Uh, De La Salle was about, I think, 1,200 students, so not a real big high school by standards uh, here. Uh, but uh, I played a lot in grade school and early high school. I played a lot of baseball and I played some golf. But then in, in high school, I, I kind of dropped that and just got more involved in uh, activities like journalism and uh, debate team and just getting involved in various service organizations. Uh, right. So I was primarily involved in that. But I, I still play a lot of sports and it's a lot of fun. That's good. Then uh, one, let's talk a little bit about college. How did you happen to select? I understand you went to Notre Dame. No, yeah, I, I don't usually say that too loud around here unless I'm explicitly asked. It's, uh, it's probably the biggest challenge I had coming to Purdue was going to the Purdue Notre Dame football games. and. Uh, the, good, the good thing is that all six years that I've been here, the game has been pretty much of a slaughter one way or the other, so I haven't hit, really had to go down to the wire. Um, that would have been a little tough. But my, my dad went to Notre Dame. Uh, he graduated in the, he was a class of 35, so he started a couple months after Newt Rockney died in the plane crash, so we go back a long way. Um, my uh, two oldest older brothers went there, um, two of my nephews, two of my kids, uh, my two sisters couldn't go because it was all male at the time. So just about everybody who could go elected to go there. Uh, my brother David decided not to go, but he went to Harvard and became a politician, so I don't know what, what that means. But uh, <laughs> Notre Dame is really a big part of, of our life. In fact, my son Scott is living in the same dorm that I lived in and my dad lived in in the 30s, oh Alumni my. Hall, so yeah, we go back a long way. Yeah. What sort of program did you take there and all about student activities? Tell us about campus life when you were there and when oh, you it, graduated. It's, uh, I, I really enjoy, it's like one, uh, they don't have fraternities at Notre Dame. Uh, the hall systems kind of take the place of that. It's very re residential focused, almost everyone lives on campus until possibly senior year and uh, you develop a lot of close friendships, so I, I really, really enjoyed that. I was a math major, and uh, because I had taken a lot of math in high school, I was essentially in the same class as the sophomore majors, and I got to know a lot of faculty, because my oldest brother, who 
was a big influence on my academic choice. Uh, Al is a, a math professor at Tulane. Uh, his uh, his um, Princeton grad school housemate was on the faculty at Notre Dame. He became my advisor. So I knew a lot of the math professors too. And sure. I had some world famous teachers in my very first year like uh, Yozo Matsushima and then later Wilhelm Stoll who are just really fabulous mathematicians and I got to know them personally because they knew my brother and it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, right. And then after, when did you graduate from and then what, tell us after? Uh, I, I, I graduated 1977 from okay. Notre Dame and then I went to Stanford uh, in computer science and I had made the decision toward the end of my junior year that, uh, I mean, I love mathematics. I essentially went through the pure math sequence at Notre Dame. I took the graduate courses. But I wanted to do something that was more, uh, uh, not just theoretical, which, which brings in all the elegance and beauty of mathematics, but also applied toward uh, real pressing problems. And that kind of drew me into computer science. So I took some courses my senior year and got interested in that. And that's why I ended up going to grad school in at Stanford. Okay. And then uh, where did you do your uh, graduate work after? Uh, well, okay. I, I, uh, I got my PhD at Stanford and uh, uh, I had uh, the opportunity to work with the person who's essentially considered the founder of the field in the, in the sense of giving computer science the legitimacy to be considered uh, a full academic discipline. And that's Don Knuth, who really uh, wrote the books that are kind of considered the, the Bible of computer science. And uh, I was very fortunate to almost stumble into working with him because Was people, he at Stanford? He was at Stanford. And people generally were afraid to go and, and even ask if he would, you know, be their advisor. And it turned out I worked on a, an open problem and I was able to find a solution. And I, I showed it to him and asked if it might be worth you know, writing a short paper about it, and he said, well, this should be an important part of a thesis, and you should do this and this, and, and essentially he worked out my whole plan, and he basically laid out that I should be, this was at the end of my first year, and he said, by the end of your third year, you should be finished, and I stuck to that and graduated in 1980, and um, I remember going through my thesis with him, um, and, you know, he was giving comments, he's, said really nice things and then at the end he said well you know you, you went through uh, pretty quickly you're graduating now in three years why did you uh, you know why did you go through so quickly and I, and I was there and I was just dumbfounded because he had told me to do that two years earlier and I wasn't about to go against his advice so <laughs> it was kind of funny but yeah. he was a, a great influence on me he's just a tremendous tremendous human being in many ways uh, of course uh, uh, world famous computer science. Right. Then tell us about the career path before you came to Purdue. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I started at Brown University as an assistant professor, uh, 24 years old, so I was pretty young. And uh, it, did you have family at that time too? Uh, I did not. I had met my wife at Stanford, and and then we got married uh, two years later, and um, and then she moved out to Rhode Island um, at that time. So uh, that that was. Uh, um, I mean, that was probably the, the biggest thing to me, you know, meeting her and then um, getting married and eventually starting a family. All my kids were born in Providence, so it has a very special place oh, yeah. to me. And Brown is where I went through the faculty ranks. I, uh, I was tenured at um, 29 and I got full professor at 32, so uh, it, it was a lot of work, but I just it's a great place. Brown is a wonderful university, and uh, it really uh, brought home to me the, uh, the incredible value of teaching because Brown emphasizes not just research, but it's very much focused on teaching. And um, for example, my very first year, um, as I taught first semester, I was also working on the design of my second semester course, which was a brand new, huge programming course uh, that would have between two and three hundred students in it and I had a team of TAs to help me design it and the two head TAs, one of whom was uh, Randy Pausch who is who's now uh, just unfortunately in the last week passed away from oh, pancreatic yeah. cancer. And he, one of the Cargany Milligan. 
Carnegie Mellon, and he's uh, he was just a tremendous individual. He was profiled by Di Diane Sawyer on an entire show of uh, is it Primetime or Nightline, yeah. Oprah. Of course, he made all the national news. His book, uh, The Last Lecture, has been seen by millions of people on YouTube. So uh, it was just a phenomenal environment. He was an undergraduate at the time. Undergraduates were extremely involved in the department. They played a major role. And it was that kind of uh, environment that uh, really brought home to me the importance of teaching and how much fun it can be at the same time. Right. OK. And then after that, what did you, before you came to Purdue, after you left Brown? Uh, yeah. So uh, I was at Brown for uh, 12 and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, went through the ranks, had a great sabbatical in, in France and, uh, and at MSRI at Berkeley. And then in the early 90s, I had the opportunity. Um, people contacted me at Duke for department chairmanship. And uh, I, I knew a lot of people at Duke from just professional connections there to just outstanding people. But it was a department that was also known in computer science circles for um, just not getting along and having just difficulty in uh, in creating a vision that people bought into. It was it was a very old-fashioned run department, top down. There was not involvement, so it was an opportunity to really make a difference with some very very good people already there and elevate it. I I think into a a, a really great department uh, and and that's what that's what I set out to do and uh, uh, it was a it was a lot of work but it it really got me interested in academic administration and it was it was it was really creating a new culture uh, sure. we had we instituted weekly faculty meetings during Wednesday lunch I figured everyone had to eat lunch so it was a good opportunity to do that and what was really striking when I vi when I interviewed there was that uh, you know, I tell people part of the reason I just went to interview is I really wanted to see if all the stories I heard could possibly be true. And I, actually, I learned some new ones I'm not going to talk about. But um, what was amazing is that everyone really wanted the department to succeed. There were no personal animosities of any significance. It was just that people didn't know how to make that happen. So we created the uh, inclusive culture with regular weekly meetings. Uh, separately, I met with all the junior faculty because they were petrified to say anything in faculty meetings. And I met with them on a regular basis that whole first semester just to get them into the Interact. notion that not only are, are they supposed to participate, but they should be the drivers of the department. They're the young blood, the energy center. And by the end of that first year, we had a really dynamic strategic plan. It set very new directions. Uh, the department had previously been focused on very traditional and somewhat outdated uh, areas. And so we had a modern focus. And by the time we started hiring, which was a full year later after we had set this basic culture into place, uh, it, it was phenomenal how successful things were. We got grad students involved in the hiring process in a major way. I think candidates were a little surprised, but also really taken by the quality of grad students and their their involvement they, uh, made them think that well here's a place I want to go to because either the grad students I want to work with right. so we hired our top three people that year and in fact uh, as department chair I think we hired something like 14 or 15 faculty and every single faculty member we hired was the number one pick in his or her search which is a you know a phenomenal know. record that I had no idea we would be able to do. But as we went along, it just kind of built and more and more people wanted to come to Brown. So so it's a top 20 department now. It's doing really well. Although I, I have to say I'm, I'm pleased that having come to Purdue, Purdue has now jumped uh, in front of both Purdue, uh, in, in front of both Duke and, and Brown in the rankings. And uh, But, but um, Duke is really a special yeah. place. It's very, very good. I would say so. Now let's move on. Now, you came to Purdue um, in the College of Science. Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. Start with the responsibilities and challenges in the curriculum. Some things, share some. Sure. Things. Well, one, one of the early things. How did you happen to hear about that position? Oh, uh, well, I, I knew people on the faculty here for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Greg Fredrickson, Susanna Hambrush, Mike Atala. 
uh, and um, the opportunity came up and I had, I had decided at Duke that I really wanted to go further into academic administration because uh, I mean in a sense computer science it's, it's not programming. Computer science is about finding solutions to problems and that's really what academic administration is. So I decided at Duke that uh, I wanted to go that route and I even went um, through the Fuqua Executive MBA program to get uh, a more foundational grounding in academic administration. That so was at Duke, though. that's a Duke, That's a Duke, okay. right, it's a, it was a third ranked um, uh, executive MBA program at the time. It was just a wonderful experience. It opens up new perspectives and new ways of thinking. So immediately after that, uh, the Purdue um, deanship became open and I was contacted for that and applied. And, um, and then we moved in, um, well I moved in, in September of 2000. My oldest daughter Jillian was um, just entering senior year. So uh, my family stayed back in North Carolina and I would I would commute more or less yeah. a couple weeks here and then a week there yeah. for that first year. Okay. Uh, so, it, uh, uh, but it, that was six years ago now. And uh, time was, flies. Doesn't it, it was. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the school. Well, let's talk about mm -hmm. some of your responsibilities and the strategic plan and curriculum. Well, yeah, the curriculum. Uh, yeah. So, what, one of the immediate things I saw when I was here my first year was in discussions with the faculty council about the curriculum when people said, "Well." really students need to be doing this or here's the current requirement and let's substitute this for that. It became clear from the discussions that it was almost impossible to make a change in the curriculum because first of all no one understood what it was even trying to do. It was this mismatch of just uh, all kinds of different requirements and, and exceptions and substitutions that didn't really give any particular coherent result. So. At the end of that first year, uh, I decided that it was time to just look afresh at what we were trying to do. And we just asked the question, what are our graduates supposed to get out of this educational process? And we charged a task force on undergraduate education uh, to look at that. And, uh, and it was actually an interesting process. It was a four-year process. Uh, by, the, by the end of that first year, actually we kind of had a restart because we learned some things and put into a we put into place a better process that was more inclusive. Uh, we found that the first process, we got a lot of good ideas, but it wasn't necessarily engaging the whole college and we wanted to make sure that happened. But once that was in place, we asked the basic question, what are we supposed to be uh, providing our students? And we came up in each department and and also in the college discussions with an amazing unanimity towards six basic outcomes. Uh, almost every department, I think every department, had five of the six as their, top, um, as their top outcomes. And those outcomes, first of all, started with depth of major, which is the fundamental one. In fact, it was the only one prior. Uh, and then it included things like critical thinking, um, which involves certain um, lab experiences, computational thinking, statistical thinking, uh, collaboration, knowing how to work together in teams, uh, knowing how to communicate both orally and in writing, and then having some multidisciplinary experience where you bring to bear on a problem different approaches because no, these big problems that we face in society are too big to be solved by any one narrow discipline. And people have to be used to looking at things from a more global perspective. Um, and then the sixth area was a sort of a broader component that brings in issues of ethics, uh, diversity, and internationalization, um, global cultures, and so forth. Uh, so we, we were able to focus on six outcomes, and then we put everything else to the side and said, this is what we want to do. Let's figure out how do we design a curriculum, both courses, and experiences so that we have options for each one of these six outcomes. We have multiple paths for each outcome. They're not all course-based. They could involve experiences like study abroad or, or doing research with a professor. Um, and that's what is the basis for our curriculum. It was formally approved after a year of pilot in uh, April of 2007. So we've gone through now one full year and uh, it's, it's very popular. It's, uh, it's really an exciting uh, accomplishment. Yes. There is no university curriculum at Purdue. 
So this is the substitute, and in fact, I think it's gotten so much attention that it has really resulted in the university strategic plan now calling for a university curriculum mm -hmm. because it, it, uh, there's a great interest in getting at some of these kinds of outcomes that we laid out. Sure, right, okay. Uh, how about the um, strategic plan? You want to make a couple comments on that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, the, that was the very first thing I started right. at, at Purdue, uh, coming in from Duke where the focus involved a lot of planning but really was about building a culture. Here, uh, it was a you know, very mature and um, highly ranked, highly regarded institution with some great departments, wonderful faculty. Uh, and uh, the opportunity, though, was to turn from the silo mentality, to use that Midwestern term, where every department or every college was really unto itself, into one where we could look at these big issues I talked about, these grand challenges that, that face society, such as finding new energy sources or making our envi environment sustainable or trying to use this, you know, this explosion of information to our advantage without, without hampering our privacy. Uh, these big issues uh, require cooperation among disciplines. So at the time, Martin Jiski had put forward his university strategic plan, which called for an increase of 300 faculty slots. So that was a great opportunity. Um, to, to target these growth areas in a way that was different from the past. And in our, in our college, that meant uh, we were actually growing by 61 positions. So uh, that's, that was over 20% of our size. And we targeted, uh, we had actually gone through two years of hiring. So we targeted over 40 of the remaining positions uh, toward multidisciplinary priorities. And the question, therefore, was what are the priorities to be? And uh, these, were, these were searches where we were not going to be de doing department searches, but we were going to be looking at these college-wide, where the, the committees would be across the college and across the university, for that matter. And in addition, um, we might not even know beforehand where the faculty member was going to have as a home. The mm -hmm. faculty member in one case, we did a uh, search in membrane science one year, and we hired four faculty. Two went into biology, one into chemistry, and one into physics. Uh, there were many joint appointments as well. So, sure. so we focused the entire year then on this issue of what should our priorities be. Uh, we asked the departments to spend two week, two months rather, focusing on laying out where they needed to be in five or ten years. What are the big issues that drive them and that they have the critical mass to build on. Uh, and then um, we opened it up to the university to suggest to us priority areas. Uh, we got over 50 white papers submitted. Uh, we had three groups of faculty who independently went through the white papers and kind of weeded them down. We ended up with 15 that we asked the uh, submitters to flesh out and put on the web. And then we had an all-day retreat on Saturdays, March 1st, 2003, uh, where we had um, 140 faculty and plus staff as well. Uh, that was half. That was over half of the entire faculty at the time. So they spent all day Saturday at a at a retreat talking about these priorities. So that's an indication that people really said this is important. And it was the first retreat the college had ever had. So it was an opportunity for people to hear about things being done that they had no idea about. It was really a great learning experience. Uh, so we had the 15 groups present in short, in, in small groups to the rest of the faculty. The faculty were divided into small groups. And by the end of the morning after this round robin set of discussions, we had a straw vote that pretty clearly indicated what were clear priorities for the college versus more, uh, say, departmentally focused ones. And uh, we spent the whole afternoon in the large group bringing everybody together to talk about some of the in-between areas. And one area that came to the fore in this process was science education research as a focus area. And it's a very non-traditional one. It's not, you know, it's not condensed matter nanoscience. It's not uh, computational science. It's actually about how you teach science. So what are the pedagogies to use, how do you assess whether you're successful, and what are the technologies that help you communicate more effectively. 
It's a very non-traditional area. It's an area that some faculty, frankly, did not think was worthy of, of hiring <laughs> faculty to do. But what came out in the afternoon discussion was just a very passionate majority of faculty who realized that this is of incredible importance to the country. Our whole future depends on it. Uh, we have a critical mass already. We even have a distinguished professor in, in chemical education. Uh, so it's something we can build on. Um, and moreover, the National Science Foundation spends a billion dollars a year on science education research, and we thought we might be able to help them uh, spend their money more effectively. So it was good. The fact that we had that discussion and the naysayers were involved in it, they really heard that even though they don't agree, there, there is this overwhelming passion and sentiment. And they understood then why we went forward and made this one of our seven priorities, our so-called coalesce priorities. Right. And as a result, we formed a center called CRESME, which is the Center for uh, Research and Engagement in Science and Math Education, uh, joint with the College of Education. It's a university center. Um, that's, that's really taken off. We have two co-directors, each of whom have joint appointments in the two colleges. One is primary in, college, in the College of Science, and one's primary in the College of Education. And that center has helped bring in the big statewide funding in K through 12 education called uh, ISTEM. And Purdue is the lead, um, the host site of this statewide partnership. So we're really poised to be a national leader. We have major state funding. We've gotten uh, important national funding. Uh, we're, we're looking at some really big um, center proposals. And uh, it's, it's very exciting because uh, it's just so critical for the future of our country. We have to, um, you, know, you know, I just think so, uh, so highly of this area uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm so proud to be an American. We're the leaders of the world in, uh, in culture and society and technology and in the economy, and it's all because of innovation. We are the leaders of innovation in the world, and if you look back at what caused that innovation? You know, today in the last, say, 15 years, the great majority of our economic growth has come from information technology. The internet is a major driver. Well, who created the internet? It wasn't created in 1995 or 2000. It wasn't created by Al Gore either. It was created decades ago. Uh, it's fundamental research that was done 30, 40 years ago that is now the driver of our economy. So that means that what our children and grandchildren will be experiencing will be based on what we do now. That's why research is so, so important. That's why we have to get students to major in science. That's why science education is so important. So uh, that's a really fundamental area that uh, means that research funding is important at the national level, and you have to get students into the pipeline. You have to create pathways for students to get excited about going into the so-called STEM fields science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, right. because that's the whole future of our country. Right. That's good. And then um, talk a little bit about your multicultural science program. Yeah. Or just a few. And well, then go your uh, K-12 through outreach. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, th they tie in very well mm -hmm. because um, we, have a, we have a dearth of people going into these areas now. In fact, that's endangering our future prosperity. And when you look at it, uh, women and minorities especially are, are not represented in the sciences and engineering. And one of our challenges, or really opportunities, is to greatly increase the percentage because that's a way of significantly boosting how many students will be graduating in those fields. Uh, so our uh, diversity office, uh, the very first thing I did at Purdue was to reorganize the dean's office to make our associate deans have focused responsibilities so that they could be more proactive in looking out at to what they needed to be doing and still allow the dialogue among the deans on issues that cross over sure. different areas. And we formed an office of diversity in the process that brought together our women in science programs and our multicultural student programs so that we would have um, an opportunity to share a lot of the same programming and support that is common to both. Um, 
And uh, in fact, our diversity director became the university coordinator for the diversity forums that are run for faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember my first year at Purdue, I went through the forums. It was a two and a half day sure. uh, workshop. And what impressed me from the, the recent alums, the minority alums who were part of it, was their frustration uh, from when they were students at Purdue uh, about how they felt disenfranchised and marginalized. And often it was their very first semester at Purdue when they would be in a group setting, whether it's a lab group or some other uh, group setting in this course, and they just felt that their views were not taken seriously. They would pipe up and say something, but it seemed like the other group members were ignoring them. Not maliciously, but in many it's cases those kids just had no experience uh, in a diverse environment. So uh, I, I immediately asked our group to start looking into what can we do to make a difference at the freshman level to kind of orient them around these, uh, these perspectives. And we formed a, uh, a program called LEAD, which is a peer group mentored um, process, uh, really a training program for freshmen. So it's run by other students. It take, takes place in the dorms where 80% of the freshmen live. And we got the buy-in from all the other colleges at Purdue and um, uh, the Office of Admissions and Student uh, Recruitment. And uh, we did a pilot, very successful, and then it was taken over by the university and it's grown. It's become part of Boiler Gold Rush. Right. So it, it makes a real difference. Um, uh, and we simply have to, you know, boost the number of people in the right. sciences, and it's a, it's a real national tragedy to have underrepresented groups who don't have those opportunities. Right. Yeah. Uh, and K through 12 outreach really has very similar goals. It's to get, it's to get kids in middle and high school excited about science, and to help work with teachers uh, to do so. So um, I would say in the last 15 years or since at least the early 90s, our K through 12 group, which is really the best I've seen anywhere. It's, uh, uh, I believe we've been in front of something like 600,000 students. Uh, we've made 2,500 class or classroom visits. But the biggest impact is through the teachers. We've had programs yeah. that inv have involved a total of 5,000. That's 000, key. Yeah, 5,000 teachers and teaching them about new approaches, especially ones that are outcomes-based. Um, the particular program that we advocate here is called SSSI, and we bring it out to some of our targeted school districts to kind of help build awareness in the teachers how, to, uh, how they can be most effective in, in getting the material across in a way that in that encourages inquiry, because that's the best way for students to learn, where they're discovering, not just right. being told. Uh, so we do a lot of programs for teachers, and, and our K through 12 group is a key part of the ISTEM initiative. In fact, the, our K through 12 director is the executive director of ISTEM. Oh, okay. So they play a major role. Yeah, there. that's kind of nice. Then um, the science, the healthcare engineering. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that for that, the researchers, so they. A little bit, they can yeah. benefit by that. Uh, th that's an, an area that um, is also very, very important. It ties in very closely to our information security group, which is the best in the world at sure. Purdue, um, because information is at the heart of healthcare and how you manage healthcare, healthcare and privacy is, is of utmost importance. Uh, so on my Dean's Leadership Council, one of our members was uh, Scott Sirota, who was president and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield. He's one of our alums. And during a conversation, it, uh, he had this great idea of, well, wouldn't it be great if we got some national, international leaders in healthcare to just come together and look at what should our healthcare system look at, look like? Uh, so, you know, throw our current system or whatever you call it out and just create a new one from scratch. What should that look like for our new gen next generation. And, and so we did that. Over the course of the next year, we designed um, a summit. Uh, we call it our CEO Healthcare Summit. We have 24 of the national leaders, thought leaders from provider organizations, insurance companies, doctor organizations, hospitals, technology manufacturers, policy 
organizations and uh, just amazingly high-powered people. Absolutely no media or publicity, so there was no grandstanding or posturing to the public. They actually just got together, worked in small groups, and came out with a report that had amazing unanimity around three basic uh, fundamental notions. One is some basic universal coverage for everyone, basic coverage that allowed voluntary uh, coverage beyond that up to the person. Uh, secondly, is it's, it's focused on informed consumerism, allowing people to see what's involved in their uh, health care so that they can make choices. They can see the costs, they can determine what's best for them, and they can therefore make uh, health care as effective as possible. And then third is personalized medicine and continuum of care, which is really getting at these new technologies. So uh, it was a very influential uh, summit. The report, I think, uh, really has some good things to say and has spawned new research projects since then. Yeah. Sounds um, good. Uh, that Science Laureate program, that's sort of something new that uh, on your watch that you Yeah, uh, the this, this Science Journalism Laureate program mm -hmm. is entering its third year now. Mm -hmm. We started it in the College of Science in 06. And uh, it's a program really designed to honor uh, science and technology journalists and communicators who display a, a very, very important role of educating the public. We're, we're dealing with issues like climate change. We're talking about evolution and intelligent design. Unless we really have information sent out and not hearsay or, or pseudo-information, then we as a society are not going to be really making good decisions. So they play a very important role, and we wanted to honor them to kind of build up their profession because they're a vanishing breed. There's a tiny fraction of the original science sections in major newspapers that existed in the 90s that are still with us today. Uh, so, um, and this is an idea that came from uh, Moira Gunn on my Dean's Leadership Council, and we took it and flew with it, and uh, it's a great success. So it brings in some of the world's leading journalists and communicators. Uh, we get to interact with them in town hall meetings. Uh, they've been rebroadcast on Tech Nation, on NPR. Really insightful exchanges, and in the process they get to see a lot about Purdue and, and uh, sure. ideally write about Purdue, which is great for us. Yeah, it's a win-win on both sides then. Yep. Um, the, uh, any, you had some change in your facilities. You've got the new computer science and one on the books, the uh, yeah. structural. Talk, make a couple comments sure. on Sure, yeah. Well, uh, our Lawson computer building science... building is very nice. Yes, the Richard and Patricia <laughs> Lawson building named <laughs> after really a computer pioneer, Richard Lawson, who founded Lawson sure. Software. Right. Um, one of our alums um, is, uh, is now home to the, the country's first computer science department. Okay. Our department in the early 60s was the very first program to establish a graduate degree. Uh, and in, in, over the years, um, you know, the facilities just have not kept up. So now it's in state-of-the-art uh, facilities, and it's, a, it's really a wonderful department. It's made a big difference. That was a $22 million structure, and the new um, Wayne and Mary Hockmeyer Hall of Structural Biology, it's about halfway built now. That's a $33 million structure that's gonna, going to house what we think is the world's leading group in structural biology, which is really a, uh, they play a key role. Uh, they're the first step, uh, along with veterinary medicine, of uh, solving um, the issue of infectious uh, disease, where um, you, know, you may detect a virus in a small animal, but then the issue is, how do you design a drug to combat that virus? And their experts, Michael Rossman, we hope will be our next Nobel Prize winner, uh, they're experts in looking at a host of macromolecules, but let's take viruses as an example. Uh, if you can understand the geometry of a virus, um, you learn a tremendous amount because in, in biology, form or geometry determines function or how something works. Right. And in viruses, uh, if you want to upset the mechanism of a virus, then if you know the geometry, you might be able to design drugs that bind to it in just the right way 
so that they can block some key mechanism and therefore stop the disease. And that's the approach of this group. And, and from that, the drug designers and chemistry and medicinal chemistry can then take their cues and design these drugs. We can then uh, manufacture them at the Child Center in Discovery Park, uh, deploy them uh, in, in uh, countries that are suffering from uh, diseases like dengue fever right. in West Nile. In fact, I'm wearing um, uh, a tie that depicts the structure of the West Nile virus, and this is a Purdue tie. It describes Richard Kuhn's group. He, uh, he's a department head, and his group he's determined the structure. Park. Yeah, and right. we, have a, uh, we don't have a company, but there is a company in California that markets ties, and we, have a, we now have three ties with them that depict various science themes, and a portion of the profits come back to, to Purdue. Uh, yeah. So we give them to, that to the group. So, so if you're out there in the audience and you want a great tie, then uh, please go on the web. And uh, <laughs> well, it's a great, <laughs> great for Father's Day and holidays. Yeah. Um, alumni, do you participate in your alumni associations at all in Notre Dame? or? Oh, yeah, alumni? sure. I usually yeah, no. ask that question to researchers. Many of them have hold offices or in a regional, and you know, it's just a comment. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm uh, especially with two kids, one having just finished and the other still at Notre Dame. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I, I certainly am, am very much involved in, in, in those activities. And, and for the Notre Dame Purdue, it's on the 50-yard line, back and forth there? Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I, am, I try to be silent during, during those games. But, uh, uh, but really, a, a whole new world opened up when I became dean at Purdue because I became involved in alumni activities from the Purdue side, and sure. it's really just a, uh, just a tremendous opportunity, and it's a lot of fun because, um, you know, as Dean, you hear a lot of complaints or, you know, budget issues are not the greatest thing to deal with all the time. But when you talk to really successful alums, they're just so happy right. about everything Purdue has done for them. They want to just... Uh, you know, just enjoy the time with you. They want to hear about what's going on. And then they contribute and they make a real difference for future generations like Richard and Pat Lawson or Wayne and Mary Hockmeyer. And that, that makes a tremendous difference. Right. Uh, I was just meeting with Bill Miller at Stanford, former Stanford provost and um, vice president for research and then S, uh, Stanford Research Institute president, uh, uh, tremendous entrepreneur. He donated three endowed professorships uh, to our college. We just filled one. Um, th they have a really a uh, remarkable impact on what we as a institution can do and um, it's um, you know we couldn't do it without them so it's a real it's a real treat right. to interact with alumni, alumni play a role like they come back for homecoming and they want to know and they're always so pleased to if someone has yeah. been here for a long you know long mm -hmm. time and remember you as a, as a student so yeah. it's, it's oh really, yeah it's, very, it's, a, it's a lot it's of very rewarding from my whole sense right a couple of your awards and honors you've got you were a guggenheim foundation fellow and uh, you're fellow of the asm the acm the ASM, association right, for computing right. machinery ACM, and the right. ieee which mm -hmm. is a similar group those are very nice honors. Nice. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm especially proud of, the, of being a Guggenheim Fellow, which right. um, was part of my first um, sabbatical. Uh, I spent both sabbatical years in France, and it's been a great experience for my family and my kids. Sure. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to do study abroad as a student. I could have if I wanted to. It just wasn't high on the radar screen. But it's so important now to get that international experience right. and. You know, all three kids now, my daughter Jillian's uh, did study abroad in Australia, and last year after graduation, she spent a year at service teaching, teaching English in a Parisian high school in France. Uh, so it was just a great experience. She got to live with my sister, who's been in France for almost 30 years. Yeah. My son's about to go to Cairo for a semester, and my daughter Audrey just spent Dre was in France for seven weeks in an immersion program in a little town in Brittany. So um, I'm, I'm really proud to see that they've taken and appreciate those kinds of perspectives because yeah, that meant a lot. It's a great experience for them. Yeah. It's really nice. How about a favorite memory of Purdue? you have one of those you'd like to share? Uh, well, I, I think my favorite memory is um, the opportunities to just talk about and brag about all the, all the wonderful faculty and the things 
that our staff and students and faculty do in the college. So um, there are what's called president forms every month, and uh, there's usually a guest speaker. And in uh, February of 04, and then again in March of 07, uh, I was asked to talk on behalf of the College of Science. And in the process of putting that together and then, and then actually delivering it and sharing it with the Purdue community, it really brings back just really the amazing talent in the college and all the great things that have happened. Uh, you know, and now that we're, we have this dual focus, not on dis, just disciplinary excellence, but also multidisciplinary mm -hmm. perspectives. And we've got the new curriculum, and uh, we're really, I think, recognizing in a more effective way what our people do. And we're hiring even better and better people each year through, a, I think, a better process of hiring. It's, it's just exciting to talk about those things and share the, the breakthroughs that our faculty have made. Uh, that, that's just been a, just a lot of fun. And this whole process of strategic planning and just having these retreats where faculty kind of get excited just learning about all these activities, th those are very, those are very rewarding. Right. Yeah. Do you have an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with us? Oh, oh well, I, um, I think really it would be about my family, so um, sure. meeting my wife Sharon and, and, and then getting married, uh, and then our, you know, our three kids um, all born in, in Providence. I can still remember very sharply each of those, each of those days. Um, I, I mean, I even, my, my middle son was born kind of early in the morning. I, it was probably the only day I've actually woken up early, and I wasn't quite sure why I woke up. I just got up and showered, and, and then when I was done, my wife said, oh, I think I have to go to the hospital. So uh, those are just, those, those events are just the most yeah. important to me. Okay. In closing, any comments for the researchers or in closing comments? What you'd like to share? Well, um, looking I, ahead or back and forth. You know, I, I just, I'm just really excited about about the College of Science and all the great things that the college does. We we have um, uh, well, our analytical chemistry group is second in the nation. It's going to be number one again, like it was in the mid '90s before long. Our st structural biology group is probably the best anywhere. Our right. information security center, Sirius, is is the best around. Statistics is a top 10 department. Computer science is ranked at either 9 or 19, depending on who's ranking. Computational science is ranked number 5. Um, math and chemistry are highly ranked. Uh, it's, it's really just a, a wonderful place. A lot of, a lot of great things are happening. Uh, it, I'm, it's kind of a bittersweet time for me because I just got the opportunity to go to Texas A&M as provost. It's a really exciting time, but at the same time, it's hard to leave Purdue. Uh, but I look forward to Purdue really doing wonderful things as a university uh, and uh, with the College of Science playing a, a really important integrative role in all of that. Good. Thank you, Dean Vitter. This concludes it. Thank you very Great. much. Great, Catherine. My Thanks. pleasure. It was my pleasure. <laughs>